As you listen to today's absolutely epic story, remember the main character was a child when all of this happened. A child. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload two or three times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please continuously maneuver your vehicle right in front of the like button's car on the highway and then turn on your blinker, but don't change lanes. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In 1937, the Japanese declared war on China and invaded their country. The United States, who was friends with China, initially did not intervene in fear of provoking Japan. But after the Japanese murdered hundreds of thousands of unarmed Chinese civilians and the Japanese attacked an American warship, the United States was forced to step in. American officials responded to the Japanese aggression by placing serious economic sanctions and trade embargoes on Japan, believing this would cripple their war efforts in China, causing them to have to retreat. However, the sanctions and embargoes did not have this effect. Instead, they just angered Japan and made them even more determined to hold their ground in China. Over the next few years, the United States and Japan attempted to negotiate some sort of settlement, but neither side would make any concessions, and so neither side would budge. A few years later, on the morning of Sunday, December 7th, 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise aerial attack on the American military base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. After the two-hour attack was done, over 2,400 Americans were killed, with another 1,000 wounded, and 300 airplanes and 20 ships were either destroyed or significantly crippled. The Japanese had hoped this attack would goad the United States into lifting the sanctions and embargoes they had placed on them from back in 1937. But instead, all the Japanese did was goad the United States into all-out war with them. One day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States officially declared war on Japan, thus entering World War II. On the day the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Jack Lucas, like every other American in the country, was glued to his radio listening to the news. He was devastated and shocked at this carnage he was hearing about in Hawaii. And so by the time the president of the United States was declaring war on Japan, Jack had already made up his mind that he was going to join up and he was going to fight for his country. However, there was an issue. Jack wasn't old enough to join the military. You needed to be 17 years old and Jack was only 14. But this was not going to stop Jack. So he created this fake document that said he was 17 years old and he forged his mother's signature on it. And then after bribing him, he got a notary to sign off on this document as well. And so Jack took his forged documentation, he gave it to the recruiter, and before long, Jack was accepted into the armed services and was on his way to Marine Corps boot camp. After completing initial training and becoming a Marine, the Marines found out Jack's paperwork was actually faked. But instead of kicking him out of the military, they said, Jack, you can stay in, but under one condition. You can't go overseas to combat. You have to stay in the United States. You can drive a truck and help out around here, but you can't deploy and go to war until you're of age. Jack was not happy about this, but initially he did as he was told, and he did just drive a truck around and support it as best as he could. But after about a year and a half, two years of this, Jack just couldn't do it anymore. That was not why he had forged this document to get into the military. He had done that so he could actually go fight in the war. And so finally, when he was just 16 years old, he abandoned his post and snuck onto the back car of a troop transport train that was going to another military base. And so when he arrived at this base, which was in California, California, he hopped off and then ran to the docks where there were these big warships and he saw one of them There was a whole bunch of troops loading onto it and he figured that's where I need to go And so he snuck onto the ship and he hid down below and then after the ship took off and was out to sea He revealed himself and he walked up to a marine officer and he kind of played off the oh I must have got on the wrong ship, but you know now that I'm here you know, Can I join your unit and this officer who had no idea how young Jack was eventually said 
okay, but prepare yourself because we're going to invade Iwo Jima. Now, Jack had never heard of Iwo Jima and did not know its significance, but frankly, Jack didn't really care. He was just glad that he was actually going to see combat. What Jack couldn't have known, and what the other Marines on this ship couldn't have known either, is that the battle for Iwo Jima would become one of the bloodiest and deadliest battles of the entire war. The Japanese that were on this island defending it were absolutely fearless and would not surrender despite being outnumbered, and they were heavily entrenched in these caves and tunnels built in all over the island and they rarely left these caves and tunnels, which meant Jack and the other Marines, when they landed on this island, the only way they could fight the Japanese was by literally crawling down into these tunnels, which were usually booby-trapped, and fighting up close and personal with the enemy. Jack's ship arrived off the coast of Iwo Jima in February of 1945, when Jack was still 16 years old. On February 19th, the first wave of Marines climbed down the side of this big ship, down onto the smaller amphibious landing crafts, and then one by one they began making their way towards Iwo Jima to begin the invasion. Jack was not part of this initial invasion. He would be going out on day two with the second wave of Marines. And so Jack and all the other second wave Marines just stood at the front of the ship and watched as these amphibious crafts made it up to the beach and then just got completely gunned down by Japanese machine gunners that were lining the beach. And so by the second day, when Jack and the rest of the Marines are getting ready to launch their assault, there are literally thousands of dead Americans just lining the beach. But Jack and the other second wave Marines, they knew this was their job, this was their duty, and so they were undeterred. They climbed down the side of the ship, they boarded their amphibious landing craft, and began the journey towards the island. As they got closer, the Japanese machine gunners opened fire not only on Jack and the boat he was in, but all of the crews that were coming towards the beach. And so hundreds of Americans were just getting gunned down before they even reached the sand. Jack and his crew managed to get to the beach. And so as the gate dropped on their boat, and as Jack is running onto the beach, the men around him are just getting cut to pieces by these machine guns. Jack manages not to get shot, and he, along with three other Marines, run up the beach and they lay down in front of the sand dune that protected them from these machine gunners. Jack knew he couldn't stay there for very long because the Japanese were also firing artillery shells onto the beach, and so it would just be a matter of time before he was blown up. And so Jack and these other three Marines that had arrived at the same time, they began moving north, doing their best not to get shot or blown up, stopping behind rocks and trees and jumping behind sand dunes, and after a couple hours of doing this, the four of them reached the airfield at the northern end of the island. And when they get there, a machine gunner inside of a pillbox, a pillbox is like a small concrete fort that only has openings on three or four of its sides that are just big enough for a machine gun to poke through. A machine gunner inside one of these pillboxes notices Jack and the other three Marines and they open fire on them. And somehow Jack and these other three Marines manage to not get shot and were able to maneuver and then fire through one of those openings and take out the machine gunner inside. And so now that this gunner is down, Jack and the others see the opportunity to run forward and take more ground of this airfield. And as they're running, other Japanese soldiers in the general vicinity, they see them, they start opening up on them from other pillboxes and other locations, and it forces Jack and these Marines to just jump into the nearest trench to avoid getting shot. And so they're jumping into a Japanese trench, which is a deep hole dug in the ground to protect yourself from getting shot. And as they jump in there, they're expecting to see Japanese soldiers coming towards them, but there weren't any soldiers. But they knew they couldn't stay there for very long because eventually Japanese soldiers would come through here and then they'd get killed. And so they quickly decided their best bet was to basically get out of this trench and run towards the pillbox where they knew they had taken out the machine gunner inside. So they could actually take that pillbox for themselves. And so their plan was they would run towards it and stop inside of each of the trenches along the way to protect themselves because they know there are other Japanese that know where they are. And then once they get to the pillbox, they can regroup and call in reinforcements. And so one of the men Jack was with said, okay, I'll go first. And so he climbs out of his trench as the Japanese are shooting at him and he sprints about 10 or 15 feet until he gets to the next trench on the way to this pillbox. And so Jack is watching as this guy jumps into this trench and as soon as he disappears out of view, this Marine is immediately turned 
turning around and scrambling to get back out of the trench. And he's trying to run back towards Jack and the other two Marines he was with. It would turn out this guy had jumped into another Japanese trench that was full of Japanese soldiers. He'd actually landed on top of an actual soldier. But these Japanese soldiers were so caught off guard by this, they didn't have time to react and shoot this Marine before the Marine was able to scramble out and get back to Jack and the others. And then for the next several minutes, Jack and these other three Marines opened fire on these Japanese soldiers in this trench like 10 or 15 feet away. And these Japanese soldiers, they too opened fire on Jack and the other three. Jack was able to take out two of the Japanese soldiers before his gun jammed. And so he ducked down into the trench to work on his gun. And as he's down there, he notices there are two grenades on the ground right next to him. And so without any hesitation, he yells grenade to the other Marines. And then he jumps on top of them, smothering the grenades with his body. One of the grenades was a dud, and so it didn't explode. The other was not a dud, and it went off. The way a grenade works is there is a small piece of explosive that is inside of metal housing that's usually spherical, and this metal housing is the thing you actually hold onto and throw when you throw a grenade. And so when this small explosive is triggered by pulling the pin and releasing the spoon, it detonates and it causes the metal housing itself to be ripped apart and sent flying. Basically, when a grenade goes off, it's like having hundreds of pieces of jagged metal shot off in every direction that are all traveling roughly at the speed of a bullet or faster. And so naturally, a grenade up close is incredibly lethal. In fact, the kill radius of a typical fragmentation grenade is about five meters. When the grenade under Jack that was not a dud exploded, it sent Jack flying into the air. And then when he came back down again, his comrades saw him and they could see he was clearly devastated from all the fragmentation that had been pumped into his body. And so they assumed he was dead. But even if they thought he was alive for some reason, there was nothing they could have done to have helped him because they were actively being engaged by dozens of Japanese soldiers that were only about 10 or 15 feet away. And so eventually, these three other Marines that Jack had just saved were forced to leave Jack where he was and retreat back to the beach, and they would all live. The Japanese soldiers in the trench that they were fighting against would eventually come into Jack's trench, but most likely when they saw Jack laying there just completely ruined from this grenade, they assumed he was dead, and so they just kind of left him there. But Jack wasn't dead. He just couldn't speak, and he couldn't see anything, and he really couldn't move, although he could wiggle a few fingers on his left hand. And so for hours, as he lay there in agonizing pain, in and out of consciousness, he just wiggled the fingers on his left hand, hoping an American would see him and know he was still alive. And you gotta figure, this whole time, it is just constant chaos all around him. His chances of survival are incredibly slim. The idea that an American is gonna find him and be able to evacuate him is almost zero, and he must have known that. But by some miracle, eventually another American unit did find their way into Jack's trench and they did notice him wiggling the fingers on his left hand. And so they were able to evacuate him from the trench down to the beach. And from there, under the cover of darkness, they were able to bring him out to a hospital boat offshore. And there he would begin the first of 26 major surgeries to remove the grenade shrapnel from his torso, his arm, and his face. Despite his grievous injuries, Jack would surprisingly make a full recovery. And eight months after his injury, the President of the United States would award him the highest decoration for bravery, the Medal of Honor. He would be the youngest recipient of this award since the 1800s, and to this day, he is one of only a handful of minors to have won this award. Following his departure from the military, Jack would survive a near-death experience while skydiving when both of his parachutes, his main and his reserve, failed, and he just smashed into the ground, but somehow lived. He would also survive a very bad house fire, and he would survive an assassination attempt on his life by his ex-wife. And so naturally, he titled his memoir, Indestructible. Jack would eventually die of natural causes on June 5th, 2008. He was 80 years old. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comment section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment section. 
If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please continuously maneuver your vehicle in front of the like buttons car on the highway and then turn on your blinker, but don't change lanes. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly two or three video uploads. We are now selling merchandise like this flannel, like this hat, and a whole bunch of other stuff. If you're interested in official Mr. Ballin merch, go to shopmrballin.com. Also, please follow our shop's Instagram page. The username is Shop Mr. Mr. Ballin, there you will find upcoming deals and promotions. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. We also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts, where we post random short videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.